All right. It looks like we're live. So Stellman, right? Thanks for coming yep. on. I really appreciate it. Would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself before you get started? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm a Christian apologist. I mean, I, I guess I'm te not technically a Christian apologist. I don't know what you have to do to like earn that title, but I've just, I've been interested in it for years and I've kind of decided as far as changing my mind on like what I want to do as a career, that this is something I think it matters. I think finding something that's meaningful and that matters to you is important when deciding something you want to do with your life. So yeah, I've been, I just, I read a lot. I try to seek truth as much as possible. So even if that means I'm wrong about stuff, try to seek truth. Um, yeah. So I started this YouTube channel, the unapologetic apologist. Some, um, if, if anybody would, was, is interested in subscribing, that's probably the, the best thing you can do for me. And I'd really appreciate it. All right, cool. Yeah, I'll put a link to your channel in the description. Um, so your position is, is that you're a theist and you believe that there are good reasons to believe in a God, correct? Yeah, yeah. Unless, unless uh, I've turned you into an atheist in like the past five minutes I was talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, I, was, I, was, I didn't know if I should expand on that. But yeah, yeah, as, as a general statement, yeah. All right, so I am an atheist, by which I mean I don't believe there are any good reasons to believe in a god, or any reasons at all to believe in a god. And the reason I believe this is because all of the evidence that indicates theism uh, can work for any of the alternatives, like naturalism. It doesn't actually work to indicate theism at all. For example, theism, the only advantage theism has over naturalistic science is these omni-properties, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, uh, necessary, eternal, perfect to say, all these kinds of things. But Science never uses these properties because they're kind of unsupported. You can make them about anything. So if scientists wanted, they could just take these properties, add them to a scientific theory like the multiverse or naturalistic pantheism, which is my preferred version, and then just get all of the benefits of theism and explain everything equally as well, but with a simpler explanation. Because theism is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, personal, eternal, and conscious, whereas naturalistic pantheism is just eternal, all-powerful, and are necessary, and that's it. That's all it needs. And so we can explain everything with less properties, making it simpler. And so it's a better explanation. And whenever you add any of these infinite properties into anything, it can explain all of the problems. You can use it to solve any problem at all with any theories because they're just so all-encompassing. They're omni-properties that can explain anything. And so any of the explanations that have these properties can explain any criticisms away. That would mean theism, deism, polytheism, pastafarianism, uh, diestheism, uh, naturalistic pantheism, any of these can explain it. But because science doesn't use these, it makes it seem like science doesn't have the same level of explanatory power as theism, but that's only because these properties aren't really supported. And so science using them wouldn't make a lot of sense because they don't have any justification. But they could. I mean, there's no problem with just adding them to a scientific theory for no reason. Like you just take general relativity and say, well, this is everything. There's literally nothing. Uh, general relativity is the end-all be-all of all knowledge, and there's no God beyond this. The natural world is all there is. But the reason Einstein didn't do that is because it's not something that science ever does. Science doesn't ever put stopping points on truth like that, as opposed to theism, which is saying, well, this is the end-all be-all absolute truth. And that's kind of where the difference between science and theology really is, is that science doesn't make absolute claims about reality, whereas theology does make absolute claims about reality. So from my perspective, if all of the arguments that you that you present for theism can work equally as well for a non-God alternative like pantheism, and pantheism is simpler, that means that it's not actually evidence of a God. Does that make sense? Yes. All right, so could you tell me some evidence or arguments or reasons that you believe that there are that indicate a God, the existence of a God? Well, well first, could I maybe put forth a couple of possible distinctions? Sure. So. When you talk about theism as a hypothesis versus, like, say, naturalism or naturalistic pantheism, which I actually want to ask you what that means, because I know what naturalism is and I know what pantheism is. Um, as far as there being a combination, I actually don't know what that means. But I would say, wouldn't it be fair to make a distinction? Like, let's say omni properties are built in as part of the hypothesis of theism, whereas they're not built in for something like naturalism. But even even if you could add them in. There's, there, there would still be a difference there, right? Right. So the naturalism, you can add them in like uh, a la carte. You can pick which ones you want to add or take apart, take away. So you can make them all the same and then you just get theism. But if you take one away like uh, personal, then you get deism because then that's just all the gods, properties of God without personal. And if you take away 
consciousness, then you get pantheism, which is just an impersonal God. And you can add multiple gods, you get polytheism. You can add some extra additional trait of supremacy, which gets transtheism or something above a god. So you can add in and take away a whole bunch of different traits in any way you want to get all kinds of differences. So yes, there would be differences. Right, but, so, but wouldn't one be less arbitrary if the omnipropities are built into the hypothesis rather than just added in? Well, no, because they're added into all of them. So you can build them into any hypothesis. The fact that you choose to build them in intentionally to theism doesn't make your theory better. It just means that like, if I chose to build in magical non-physical spaghetti into the spaghetti monster, it doesn't make it a better theory just because I intrinsically made it a part of the theory. So the fact, the reason science doesn't add those in is because they're totally ad hoc. They don't do anything that have no explanatory power. They add nothing to the theory, but they could. Like anybody could just take a scientific theory, add these properties in, and it'd be exactly the same as theism. But what if that's not the case? What if, like, um, it's not necessary? And, and this could be the case sometimes. What if it's not always the case of, okay, there's a Christian, he has this Christian God in mind, and then so he comes to all these arguments, and he says, well, I want my Christian God to be the one uh, that's deduced from these arguments for theism, so I'll take all these I'm probably and attribute them to my Christian God, versus um, a guy like Ed Fazer, who wasn't he? He was an atheist, and he reasoned from effect to cause, and realized that okay, when you're trying to deduce what would the properties of a necessary part of reality look like, they start to look like omni properties. Right, and I'm from my perspective, those are totally made up. Like when you try to address what a necessary or, or uh, greatest possible thing looks like, and you try to attribute properties, they're all made up. There's no justification for any of those. You can just say magical non-physical spaghetti is equally as plausible as aseity and actuality and perfect simplicity. They're all totally made up. So there's no justification for any of those. You can, they're just arbitrarily added into a theory. It only appears that there's justification because of the arguments, which are all kind of ad hoc. And I'm happy to demonstrate that for any ones you think actually work. Okay, so... I was reluctant to do this. I kind of want to jump into one of the more complicated arguments, which I'm not uh, super confident I can defend super well, but maybe have you heard of the, arg the Aristotelian argument from change? Yes. Okay, so maybe we don't have to get into that too much. But so it, it essentially defines change as the actualization of a potential. So right. like this microphone just has the potential to be here. So it, it's almost contingent in that way. But it, and but it's, it's actually here. And for something to go from potential to actual, something already has to be actual to actualize that. And essentially when you get to the bottom of that, it looks like an unactualized actualizer just because of the impossibility of an infinite regress. And so let's take one of the omni properties like omnipotence, right? So one of the ways things are actualized is by an exercise of power. So I have, I have the power to move this microphone, right? So power is imputed. So when you get to the unactualized actualizer, it has to have the power to actualize all other things. It has to be the source of all power. And so it's all powerful in that sense. So where would you disagree with that as far as power being a made up property? Well, uh, we'll start with just the unactualized actualizer. The first thing is the change. Change is a description. It isn't a property of things. So if you say that there's some change from potential to actual, that's you're just describing how reality is. You're not actually describing a part of reality. So it's like if I said, that's a tree. I mean, the word tree is just some English word we've come up with. If I wanted to say there is some epitome of English wordiness that is tree, it's totally made up. There's no objective uh, word that is tree that comes out of the universe itself. There's no essence of the word tree. It's just a made up language. So actual and potential are the same thing. They're just made up words to describe features of reality. The features of reality exist independently. They're not potential and actual. Those are just made up terminologies. Like you can say Hume denied causality completely. Maybe he's right. Or maybe there is uh, reverse causality where time can go both ways like in physics and entropy. Or maybe there's uh, B theory of time where all time just exists independently and there is no change at all. It's just uh, equivalent. So there's all these different theories about what cause is and what time is. And so you're assuming that this one interpretation is right, but this one interpretation gives us no evidence. There's nothing to support this at all. Like none, none, none of the physics is supported by this. Nothing of the, the most philosophers reject Aquinas. There's pretty much no evidence of this. It's just an argument and that's it. So this is one of the least supported interpretations of what cause is. It's just a made up definition. And you're simply accepting this made up definition and saying, well, based off this made up definition, there's this epitome of this definition that I've made up. It's, I really like um, Martin Luther's critique of Thomism where he says uh, his arguments are essentially, it seems to me, I think, therefore I believe. 
it's they're all purely circular. You're just making up terms to justify other terms. So it's I completely reject the idea of a potentialized or an actualized actualizer or an unactualized actualizer. But even if I wanted to grant it, let's just say let's grant that that's true. I can say, okay, fine, we have an unactualized actualizer, but that thing is just an undiscovered property of nature. You don't need a mind for that. You don't need a god for that. All of these properties are ad hoc. You just need something that has enough power to create everything. Okay, so two, two things with that. So first, you're you're not denying that change is a real feature of the universe, right? You're you're saying you're more denying that, say, potential is something is some kind of substance out there that exists, and then something comes along and actualizes that substance of potential into something actual. You're denying that, and I, I think that's fair. But you're not denying that change is a real feat is something that happens in the universe, right? Well, actually, yes. Hume denied causation completely. So, and the B theory of time denies causation completely. So, you can completely reject causation. And that's that's a more legitimate interpretation than Aquinas's interpretation, even if it's a ridiculous interpretation from my perspective. But change so, is, so you, is the human description of how the universe functions. Change is not a feature of the universe. There is no such thing as change. There's just stuff happens, and we describe that stuff as change. So, wait. So, do you actually uh, affirm the B theory of time? It's just a possibility. So, so you would be more in the A theory camp? Um, no, I don't affirm A or B theory. I th affirm something different. In Could fact, you describe most, that? Because, because, because I, I mean, not not if you don't want to. I just I want to try to maybe get somewhere on this change idea that I well, don't know that we could if we don't agree on some kind of more fundamental stuff. I would have to actually go back and read all the stuff to try and be able to articulate that clearly. But if you go to this, the uh, Phil Survey's paper, most philosophers don't accept either the A or the B theory of time. They're, those are both minority viewpoints. They usually have some kind of other. It's usually the majority viewpoint. So, but that would be, it would be hard for me to explain just off the top of my head. I'd have to go back and actually research what it is exactly. Okay, fair enough. So, but but to, do you think that, believe that things actually come into existence and go out of existence? No. Okay. So, but, but you don't know from the B theory. Right. Okay. So I, I don't know if I can critique your view then, because like most of my critiques are of the B theory. So, so essentially, you can think of my viewpoint as um, stuff is eternal. There's always something that has existed. Okay, so I'm I'm trying to say is because obviously, so it, it, it's similar to the B theory, right? Because you could say, um today exists just as eternally as yesterday? Uh, well, no, because I would affirm a kind of change. Change is, there is something that is happening and we describe that something as change. So stuff different, there are different relationships at different times in the universe, but all of the stuff in the universe has always existed. It's not, it doesn't come into existence. It doesn't stop existing at some point. Oh, so okay. it's kind of like eternal, eternal matter, essentially. Right, and then maybe just different forms of it like we can reform metal into an engine and right. so an engine technically comes into existence but not in the sense that that's new matter that came right. into existence but, but so wouldn't that be change uh it would be what we describe as change but the stuff that that is changing is always existing it's just a different relationship between the already existing stuff okay well so so i think we can still make the argument from there because, I mean, because that would still, like, so, okay, so you could still say, okay, we have all these metals and all these screws and bolts and just it's in a junk pile. It has the potential to be an engine, right? Yeah. And so, okay, and so in order for that to be actualized, something already actual has to make, has to bring that about, right? Um, not necessarily, no. I mean, because so, again, th those terms don't really mean anything in this context. Like, the, it just needs to interact in such a way that it becomes what we call an engine. It doesn't need to be caused in that sense. Right. I mean, but it, the, the, the pile of machinery wouldn't do it itself, right? Yeah, it could. could definitely do that. That was one of, the, one of several of the interpretations in quantum mechanics is that there is a probability of those things just falling into place. Yeah, but, but there's a difference between, you know, probability, like people theorizing, and the fact that we... I mean, you, would you point to any examples of that happening? 
well, yeah, everything we see in physics is essentially that happening. Like, all, if we look at a particle, the complexity of a particle is equivalent or greater than the complexity of an engine. And the fact that it happened to be in that way is equally or more complex than the engine. If we look at the composition of the Earth, the way the particles aligned to make the Earth is far more improbable than an engine or any human design ever. But it happened purely by natural random processes. Okay, well, so two things there. But so you're, so you're obviously not pointing to an example of an engine doing that. Like we don't right. have an example of an engine, right? But as but then so so to say to me to say, well, a particle is more complex than an engine, but we know that didn't have to happen. To me, would beg the question, as because well because we're we're discussing atheism versus theism, right? And so obviously on theism, God would have created particles, whereas on atheism that wouldn't be the case. So when it, isn't it kind of to beg the question just to say, well, the particle is more complex, but we know that doesn't have isn't actualized by something else. Well, we know the process by which the particles are created, which is the laws of nature. And so we don't need a God to explain how particles form and how the planets form. Like we, we don't imagine from most theists that I know, they don't imagine that God literally finger placed like every single particle into place. He more like started it and kind of a bunch of natural processes happened. So I'm just talking about the natural processes. No, no, fair know. enough. I know, like it'd be, it'd be like if I said, well, you need God to explain a flower growing. Well, no, obviously you don't. Obviously we can explain flower growing through science and all these things, but that, that wouldn't be in contradicting in contradiction with a God who creates a universe with natural orderly laws that allow for things like flowers to grow. And even how you're talking about particles coming to existence. I, I could totally get on board with the naturalistic explanation that wouldn't rule out a God that creates the natural laws that allow that to happen in the first place though. Right, right. So my argument is, is that you can do everything, everything that can be explained by the supernatural can be explained by the unknown natural. So just like you can suppose that there's a God who designed the universe, I can suppose that there's a naturalistic pantheism that has a certain kind of a nature which results in this kind of a universe. So it's kind of like if we see an engine, like obviously we wouldn't think an engine was designed because there's no natural process that we've seen that can create engines. But if we look at yeah. a mountain, a mountain is far more complicated than an engine, but there are natural processes that make mountains. And so we don't think it's designed. So there could be, and there's, it's equally reasonable to assume that there's a natural process that could make an engine as it is to assume that there's a magical being that can create an engine. I, I wouldn't agree with that though, because like saying, okay, we can look at this natural processes that creates par particles, and obviously particles are more complex than engines. We still don't have any examples of engines that are created just by natural forces. Like, I mean, we can talk about stuff like bacteria, how that's more complex than engines, but I'm, I'm talking specifically about engines. Well, right. Well, this is where you're kind of begging the question, because you've picked an object we know is designed that doesn't occur by natural processes. I mean, there's infinitely many things that don't occur by natural processes. There's infinitely many particles that don't occur by natural processes. But if we saw that particle, we wouldn't think, ah, well, it must be designed because we didn't find a natural process for it. I mean, so it does, you're begging the question by picking something we already know intuitively is designed, which then gives us this intuition that it must be designed. So if we start with just a random object, like a new particle, if we discover a new particle that we've never seen before, we know of no natural process of how it made, we're not going to say it was designed. We're going to say, yeah, it was probably just probably a natural process we have to learn about. Or if we discover a Tesseract, do you know what a Tesseract is? Only from the Avengers movies, but not. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a four-dimensional object. So if we found a four-dimensional object, that's something that means like, because we live in a three-dimensional space, if we lived in... So it goes into the fourth dimension. Um, it's hard to explain, but so if you found this four-dimensional object, we wouldn't assume this was designed by something. We just assume there might be some natural process that creates this extra-dimensional object that we just don't know how to do yet. So we don't infer design just because we find something we don't know the natural process for. But does, but because of engines, we right. know. So the I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not trying to. I'm not even trying to uh, infer design. I'm just. I'm trying to infer that. And actually, I probably should have done this earlier. I. I was kind of insisting on there has to be kind of a maybe a person who brings the potential of the machinery into an engine. But even if I were to say grant that natural laws could do it, then that's still already actual natural laws that bring the potential that that turn the that cause the potential of the engine to be an actual engine. Right. So if you wanted to say that something exists and that exists has causal influence to re cause things to happen in the future, then yes, I can grant that. Okay. So and so this is the point of the hierarchical change, right, is that in order to have an actual explanation of things, there has to be a first member in that series. And that first member of something can't be potential in and of itself because then it's not an actual explanation. 
So two objections there. One, you don't need a first member. An infinite set is completely reasonable, completely possible, and there are no contradictions in that. Two, it doesn't need to be purely potential. It can be any number of infinitely many things that we don't understand yet. It could be completely material. No problem with that. You don't need pure potentiality there. That's just a made-up term. It doesn't mean anything. You mean, so you mean pre-actuality? Because pre obviously... Well, yeah, potentiality versus act pure actuality, you don't need pure actuality. There can be a composite thing, which is the first thing. You can have an infinite set, which is the first thing, or the necessary thing. So the infinite set, I, I don't agree with, but I do think we can, we can allow for that for the moment. So as far as the, what did we just say? The, the second pure objection. actuality, we don't need something of pure actuality to be the necessary cause. And, okay, so here's, here's why I don't agree with that, and tell me what you think. So Ed, Ed Fazer gives the example of, okay, we're gonna, I have this picture, right? And I'm going to attach it to two brackets on the end, and I'm going to attach those two brackets to two rods at the end. But then suppose I just said, I'm not going to attach the rods to anything, I'm just going to leave it sit there. Well, that's not an actual explanation, right? Because the rods can't, can't just... Be the first cause in and of themselves even if you attach them to the wall the wall can't be the first cause in and of itself so anything that has potential can't be the first cause because it's not an actual explanation right and so if you're saying well the first member in the series could be some completely material thing a material thing is always going to have potential because you can always rearrange the, the parts it's composed of and so I don't see how we, we, we can ever explain anything here or now, even if we're not talking about a linear series that extends into the past, but just kind of a, a bottom-up series. Right, so there's absolutely no problem with that at all. Like, for example, uh, Agrippa's Trilemma says there are three ways to explain anything, infinite regress, circular reasoning, or dogmatism. So dogmatism would just simply be the first cause. There's just one ultimate cause of everything. Circular reasoning would be a thing caused in itself, a cause of sui argument. And infinite regress would be just uh, infinite regress of things, individual things. Now, that infinite regress can be considered a set, and that single set can be like the single starting point. So you can have an infinite series, which is itself the starting point, and there's no problem with that. Um, specifically in time related to A theory, B theory of time, or the multiple dimensions theories of times, like um, Itzelbar's two time physics, or Stephen Hawking's imaginary time, you can have those kinds of circular relationships where there's something that causes itself, causes sui, or you could have an infinite regress series, and there's no contradiction in physics with that. So all these arguments that are brought against this are purely just only if you apply the standard model of physics, which d doesn't apply. So you can totally have an infinite regress or circular reasoning in the current models of physics to explain everything. You don't, there's no contradiction there. Yeah, so, so I, I mean, here's the thing, there's, there's philosophical arguments for why you can't have an actually infinite number of existing, of existing things in a set. So, I mean, I th it's, it's, it's perfectly fair to say, well, here's all these alternative theories to explain it, but if there's one that's not coherent, I don't think it's it's necessarily fair to put that as far as the competing explanations. Right. Oh, well, I'm but, familiar but, with all those philosophical arguments, and none of them work. They're all rejected by most philosophers and most physicists. So, could you give me one, and I can explain to you why it doesn't work? Well, sure. Like like the one, for example, that if we're even describing, say, mathematical equations as related to an actual infinite set, that you can get all kinds of contradictory answers, like infinity minus infinity equals three. You can also get infinity minus infinity equals infinity, or infinity minus infinity equals ten. And I'm, if you, you're familiar with it, I don't. Unless you want me to expand on it, I can. Oh no, I'm familiar with it. So we can just go with uh, x minus x equals five. X minus x equals two. I mean, there's totally there's no contradiction there because you're just talking about two different x's. Like you can say uh, one x can equal x one, and one x can equal whatever x2 equals, and you can get contradictory answers when you subtract them. Infinite isn't a number. It's a set. It's a property of a set. So you, when you subtract infinites, you're not subtracting the same thing. You're just subtracting two different infinites, so you don't get a contradictions. So it's like, if I subtract a bigger infinite from a smaller infinite, you get a negative infinite. If I subtract a smaller infinite from a bigger infinite, you get a positive infinite. And if I subtract two infinites of the same time, same size, you get zero. Just like if you subtract a bigger x from a smaller x, you get a negative. And if you get a, subtract a smaller x from a bigger x, you get a positive. And if you subtract two x's of the same size, you get zero. There's no contradiction there. Infinite just isn't a number. So in set theory, I agree with that. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm a non-realist when it comes to mathematics. I don't think numbers actually exist at all. So I certainly agree that infinite is not an actual number. Um, 
Well, no, right. no, I mean, infinite isn't a number. It's not a number at all. It's a description. It's a property of a set. So it's not actually a number. So when, like, William Lane Craig does this comparison of how you subtract and add infinites, he's just confusing infinites for numbers. They're not numbers. They're more like variables. Like, if you subtract x from y, I mean, of course, you can get different answers because you can have different numbers for x and y, just like you can have different numbers for the infinite. It could be a bigger infinite or a smaller infinite. So there isn't a contradiction there at all. There's no contradiction in set theory with adding and subtracting infinites. So I, I got mixed up on part of what you said there. So infinite is just a descriptor, right? But but the a set, when you say set, are you saying that a set ha, does a set have parameters? Yes, it's infinite is one of the parameters. It's not it's not actually a number. But that's not that's not a parameter. That's saying it can extend infinitely in any. No, that's a parameter. That's literally infinite is one of those parameters of a set. It's not actually a member of the set. It's the parameter of the set. So are there different versions of infinite? Yes, there are tons of different versions of infinite. You just, uh, there's a great YouTube video by a mathematician where she goes through a bunch of different ones. Uh, big theta, big omega. Uh, the, you can add and subtract infinites with hyperreals and ordinal numbers. It's a really interesting topic. There are tons and tons of differences in infinites. Okay, so, so we're missing each other. So I, when I say infinite, I mean something that has no limit at all. And you're saying there's, that's one of them, but maybe there's other ones. Well, yeah, that's the point. That's like saying X. Like the variable X doesn't mean anything. It could mean lots of these different things. It could mean one or two or three or four or five. And so if you're getting contradictions, right. if you're subtracting X from X, it just means you're using two, dip, two of those different possibilities for those X's. There's no contradiction there. You're just using two different X's. So when you say infinite minus infinite, it's the same Hold thing on. as saying X minus X. Hold on. I, I don't, I'm not sure that there's not a contradiction. Because, for example, if, if we just put X minus X, right? Or let's do X1 minus X2. And let's say, okay, I've answered five, three, four, all these different answers. And then let's say we discover what X is. And you say, oh, okay, so now that I know what both the Xs are, I know this answer was correct, but all these other answers were false. In order for all the answers to be correct, though, each of the Xs would have to be able to be multiple things or infinite quantities. Right, exactly. So when you say, when William Lane Craig says infinite minus infinite, it's because it ha has multiple things. It could mean multiple things. If you actually define the infinite and make it a particular kind of infinite, there's no contradictions. You're going to get the same result every time 100% of the time. So the, the contradictions are the same thing as when you say x minus x and you just mean different x's. But I, d I don't know how that's not a contradiction if we're saying something called infinite can actually have no limits, but it can also have limits, depending on how you're describing it. Um, I'm not, what do you mean limits? Like, well, because you said X can be all these, you said infinite can be all these different things. Yeah, there's different kinds of infinites. And do any of those kinds have limits? They're not the other kinds of infinites. So yeah, in that sense, I mean, like, Infinite isn't a single number, so in that sense, it's limited. So it, infinite can't just literally be anything. It can't be a pork chop. Agreed. So, so infinite. There are different kinds of infinites, and one infinite is not the same as another infinite. So, in that sense, they do have limitations. Like alpha, alpha null is the is a countable infinite, and it's the the only or the smallest countable infinite. There are other infinites which are not countable infinites, like big omega, that is not a countable infinite. So, in those sense, they do have limitations. But so there are different kinds of infinites, just like there are different kinds of x's. You subtract x or subtract x from y, you can get different results if you're using different x's and different y's. Just like if you subtract infinite from infinite, you can get different results if you're using different infinites and different infinites. There's no contradiction there. It's just bad math. You, you need to be specific and say, when I say infinite, I mean this particular kind of infinite. I'm... I, I guess I would just disagree that anything with limits would count as a kind of, of, of infinite because as far as like, and gr granted, this might just be a lack of sophistication on my part, but I'm, I'm using infinite in a very strict sense, which means it has no limits. Now, if you would prefer I, I not use, say, the word infinite, I could just say is set without limits. Well, no, I grant that definition. The problem is, is that definition applies to many different things. There's many different kinds of things that have no limits. It's not wait, just okay, wait, so if you agree with the definition that infinite, the, so the definition of infinite is something without limits, right? So yeah. how, could, how, could that, how could that term then be used to apply to something that has limits? Well, it's like Hilbert's Hotel. You're familiar with Hilbert's Hotel? Yes, vaguely. So there's, there's smaller kinds of infinites that have no limits. They still have no limits, but they're smaller than other kinds of infinites that have no limits. But if if neither thing, but if if neither thing has any limits, then how can one be bigger or smaller? 
because you can fit all of one of the infinites into one of the other. That's the point of Hilbert's hotel. So there can be alpha null as a countable kind of infinite. Well, right, but that, that that's part of the absurdity of it. Is well, that's, that... that's not an absurdity. That's just math. Like that's there's no contradiction there. It's like if I if I say in between the numbers one and two there are infinitely many points, right? In between the numbers one and five there are infinitely many points, but the numbers in between one and five they're significantly bigger. There's significantly more of them than the numbers between one and two. Specifically, there's five times. So this this infinite between one and five is five times bigger than the infinite between one and two. So so infinitely infinitely many what? Between one and two points, so like one point zero 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 one, one point zero 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 two, one point zero 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 three. There are infinitely many points between one and two. Would there actually be if would we, like if we were actually like let's say hypothetically we had infinite time to sit down and write down all the points? Would would we ever reach a limit or no? No, you would never reach a limit. You can go on with you can keep adding zeros and just add a one at the end, add in fun item to get infinitely many points between one and two. And you can do the same thing between one and five, but there's more points between one and five than there is between one and two. Oh, okay. So, okay. So I, I wouldn't agree then because if both, like, it seems so intuitive, right? To say that there's, because, okay, we're making a category mistake, right? So if we say there's infinite things between one and two, and then there's infinite things between one and five, well, okay. Between one and two, what? Well, it doesn't make a difference for the analogy. The point is just to show there's no contradiction in the math, so you don't have a contradiction. No, because the because if we're saying but between one and two and then between one and five, we're we're jumping from concrete now to abstract to say, well, okay, but now when we abstract it out, we can write infinitely many zeros. But okay, but let's say if we if we can go infinitely, I'm I'm doing a terrible job articulating this. But well, I, I understand. Just... I understand you're going to concrete examples, but I'm just trying to just focus on the abstracts right now. There is no contradiction in abstracts with adding or subtracting infinites. You just have to be specific about the infinite because there are different kinds of infinites. So you could say if you're adding, if you're subtracting one infinite from another, if you're subtracting like the infinite between one and two from the infinite between one and five, then you're going to get a positive infinite. If you subtract the infinite between one and five from the infinite between one and two, you're going to get a negative infinite. And if you subtract the infinite between one and five and one and five, you get zero. There's no contradiction there. There's no logical contradiction between doing this math. You just have to be specific about which infinite you're talking about. Because if you don't, and it's ambiguous, you're going to get seemingly contradictory answers. So there is no contradiction between adding and subtracting infinites like William, Craig, William Lane Craig presents it. It's just a misunderstanding of set theory. You have to be specific about which infinite you're talking about. And so if, we're just, if we can grant that just about abstracts, then we can move into the concrete topic. Well, I, I would say that that's kind of the point is that, yes, you can do this in extreme, like that there is a whole, like, theories of math that allow for that to happen. The point is that it, it you, you, we can't conceive of, it, of an actual concrete example of it. And just real quick, going back to the one and two between one and five, my argument is it seems so intuitive to say that there's a, a bigger group between one and five than there is between one and two. But at the end of the day, if both of them can literally be wrote out to infinite, then the quantity is the quantity is the same. There's not actually a differentiation in quantity there. Well, no, there is, and that's a provable fact. That's what the foundation of set theory is, and the point of Hilbert set, Hotel. Yeah. Right, but but we're not talking. But okay, so that's been the problem: is we're kind of jumping back between concrete examples versus. Well, I'm just focusing just on the abstract. There is no contradiction in the abstract here at all. There's no contradiction okay. between adding and subtracting infinites. So I, I yes, okay. So I think I can agree with that. I, I'll have to think about this later because some of this is new to me. I think I think yeah, I don't actually have any problem with that with saying okay. that when we're talking about abstracts. My 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 point would be to say to to think that that could occur with concrete things. I think would be really weird. So maybe you could help me with that. All right. So the concrete things is the same thing. Whereas even if we can't, because our brains can't comprehend infinites, does not mean that they can't exist. The reason we can't comprehend them is just a limitation of how our brains work. It doesn't suggest that they can't exist. Like we can't imagine a tesseract that doesn't indicate a tesseract can't exist. That's fair. I would say there, there, there's a difference. Like just because we can't comprehend something, we can still apprehend it. And I think that's one of the things with the infinite is obviously, yeah, we can't completely comprehend what, what an actual infinite would be like. We can't wrap our minds around that, but we can still apprehend specific examples. Like 
like we're doing these examples right now. Like when we say, okay, theoretically between one and five versus between one and two, we're apprehending it in that way. Like we, we can understand different aspects and, you know, come up with thought experiments about it. Is that fair? Sure, but how is that different from a tesseract? We can't apprehend a tesseract. Even if we saw one, we wouldn't be able to see the four dimensions because we can only see in three dimensions. Okay, well, so when I say apprehend, I mean like, like let's say we we if we saw we we wouldn't see four dimensions, right? But let's say we could like could we possibly come up? And this is I, I'm not familiar with tesseract, so this is me being out of my game here. But would it be fair to say maybe we could come up with certain equations on and study it in that way? Yes, we can use math and equations to describe a tesseract, just like we can use math and equations to describe adding and subtracting infinites. So they're the exact same kind of example. That's why I picked it. Right. So, so yeah, okay. So that that's the only distinction I'm making between apprehending something versus comprehending it. Like comprehending would mean we completely understand it. We can get the grasp of it. And I'm agreeing that with a lot of things, and God is that way, we can't completely comprehend. But apprehend just means we we can we can understand some things about it. All right, so going back to my example, uh, we can equally, uh, we, need, we can't comprehend a tesseract or an infinite, but we can apprehend both equally using mathematics. So what's the difference between the two? Like there's no contradiction between an existing tesseract. There would only be a contradiction in us being able to imagine or, or comprehend an existing tesseract. Could you say that again? I'm sorry. So the tesseract, an existing tesseract is like an existing infinite. We could not comprehend it but we can apprehend it. We can describe it using math in both, both cases. Right. I, I would say it's because we can apprehend it that means we, we can understand why, okay, in abstract form, these things might be able to work, but in a concrete form, they wouldn't. But, but again, going back, a tesseract can exist. There's no contradiction with a tesseract existing, even if we can't yes. compre whichever one, comprehend or apprehend it. Whichever one we can't do, it can still exist. There's no problem with it existing. I agree. And the same thing applies to infinites. Well, no, I, I would say it only works if infinites are like a tesseract. Like if there's some kind of, I don't know. That's, that's the argument I'm making is that they are so exactly the same. In is what that, way? Is that the tesseract can't be comprehended because of the limitations of our mind. But as soon as we get this new, this new way to look at it, this new way to apprehend things through a new mathematical analysis that works in a different way than our mind does, we can clearly apprehend what it looks like without any logical contradictions. Infinites are the same way, is that even if we can't understand them when we think about them, we can still use the same mathematical analysis we do for the Tesseract to come to the conclusion that, yes, there is no logical contradiction with this thing existing. I, ju I just, I don't, because a Tesseract and an Infinite doesn't, it doesn't like share any properties. Oh, right. It's an analogy I'm making between the fact that the Tesseract... Oh, right. So, so listen, I, I agree with that. I, I agree with the analogy for the Tesseract. I'm, the only point I'm making is, okay, we, we can theorize about a Tesseract and we can say, okay, I can, I can understand how I, just because I wouldn't be able to comprehend it doesn't mean that it couldn't exist. But I, I would I would say it's different for Infinite. It's because we, we can comprehend things we about concrete things around us that we can study and we can learn about and we understand you know what reality is like and so when we theorize about infinites unlike the tesseract i th do think we can come to the conclusion that okay an actual infinite number of things concrete things couldn't exist right because if, if it's not if, if an infinite number of concretes isn't doesn't share any properties with the tesseract then we can't conclude that just because in this one case it works that therefore in this case it'll work too well, no, what I'm saying is that this you're pointing out these apparent contradictions and in infinites based off of the world we live in, the apparent world we live in. We can point out the same contradictions in tesseracts based off the world we live in. Like we live in a 3D world, so if you try to talk about what does it mean to take a right angle uh, to a right angle to all of the, the sides to make it a 4D object, that would be a contradiction. It's not possible in a 3D world. So we can all say that makes no sense. There are clearly contradictions here. It clearly can't exist. But in reality, we just lack the ability to comprehend what a 4D space would look like. It's not that it's impossible. It just seems impossible Ooh. because we're limited to our small perspective. And infinites are the same thing. They seem impossible because we're limited to our perspective. But once you look at it from this larger perspective, they become equally as possible as the Tesseract. Okay, so I was I was misunderstanding some things about the Tesseract. So I a couple of questions. So we're talking about Tesseract being a four-dimensional object, right? Yes. And when you say we live in a three-dimensional reality, are you saying that 
three dimensions that we know of, or th or we can prove that reality is structured in such a way that it only exists in three dimensions. No, I'm saying that our, in, from our perception, we can only perceive the X, Y, and Z axis. We can't perceive the third, a fourth axis. There can right, still but, be a fourth axis. Right, and so and science hasn't ruled that out, right? Right. We've mathematically we've actually shown that's probably the case that there is one in that case. Okay. So yeah, I there's that that's perfectly fine to figure out to fit a test track in that framework then. So I would say infinites work the same way. Just like we can't understand the tesseract in our three-dimensional space, we can't understand an actual infinite when we look at the world and try and compare it to our experience of the world. But within the mathematical framework, we can completely understand it and and show it as equally possible without any contradictions, just like we can show a tesseract is equally possible without any contradictions, even though it contradicts our apparent reality. I'm trying to work through that. I'm trying to come up with an example, but I feel like it would turn out terribly if I did. Okay, I, w I would say I think you got me on that. Thank you. That's that's a very kind concession. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. I. It's all you can you can come back later as soon as you come up with something. We'll have another conversation. Yeah. We'll come back with a retort. Yeah. Fair, yeah. Fair enough. We'll have lots to have you. Well, 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 maybe we'll reverse roles next time. You can come on my show. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Right. So, would okay. you want to move on to a different argument? Sure. Um, I was going to say the com cosmological argument. That's just going to get us into the kind of the same stuff discussion discussions of infinites. Uh, how about the argument for morality? So I actually believe in objective morality, um, but okay. I, morality could be, you don't need a God for morality. It could be an undiscovered law of nature, kind of like gravity. And it affects our minds just like gravity affects our bodies. So we can say that there is an objective morality as a feature of the universe, which is just an underlying law that we haven't discovered yet. You don't need a God for that. Okay, so I, I can go with that. My only thing is, I don't see why we'd be, we would be on any under obligation to obey it if that were the case. Why would we be under any obligation to obey God? Well, he, he created us. The universe created us, so why wouldn't we be equally obligated under it? Look, it's, it's a thing. It, it can't like hold us responsible for our actions. So you're saying that we should obey God because he's going to punish us if we don't? Not, not, I'm not, we can rule out the punishment thing. We, I mean, we could get into it if you wanted. I'd, I'd prefer to stay on theism, not Christianity. But oh, well, what do you mean when you say hold us accountable? He's like going to do something, right? Like I don't like I'm not sure what you mean by hold accountable. So he's going to judge us in some way to be able to assess that what we've done is immoral. So I, I'm using that as just a synonym for punishment right now. Oh, okay, 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 okay. I guess let's go with that. And so why would that in any way obligate us to do anything? Because it seems no different from saying like utilitarianism, we shouldn't do something because we're going to be punished. By other people, right? Well, just saying that there's some pragmatic consequence, and therefore we should do something because of. Well, the no, I wouldn't. Even, I wouldn't even say because I. I wouldn't say it's just pragmatic that we don't want to be punished. I would say if if a god created us, he he created us. He has the right to set forth some rules, and he has the right to say, "Here's my purpose for the universe," and so don't go around torturing people because that's that's not part of my purpose. I would just say he has that. He has that right. Well, I see that as horribly immoral. That's slavery to me. If you're forced to be in a universe without your consent to abide by someone else's purpose, that seems to be by definition slavery. So that, that would consider that incredibly immoral. That wouldn't give him the right. That would just mean he's an immoral dictator. Yeah, I don't, I don't agree. Because, the way, I mean, obviously the way we, could, we think of slavery is like, okay, I've come and I take you out of your house and I chain you up and I force you to be my slave, right? But like, we're, we're both equally human. I don't have any kind of rights over you, right? I didn't, I had nothing to do with your coming into existence and things like that. So I certainly don't have the right. But if, if there's a God who created us, you know, we are, owe our existence to him. We don't exactly have the right to choose what kind of universe we're in. Well, I would disagree. I don't think the fact that he created us gives him any special rights. I think that morality comes from each individual's uh, being themselves. So it is always immoral to force anyone to do anything against their consent, essentially. So it doesn't matter who created you. It doesn't matter if you're the, the creator of the universe or just some bug. It, either way, it's still immoral to 
to harm that being against their consent, no matter what, doesn't matter what your relationship is. Each individual themselves has the moral aptitude to be respected, has, has I forget what it's called, moral worth or something. Sure. But wh why should I have to respect that? Why should you have to respect that? Well, I just yeah. say it's moral. It's the moral thing to do. And something is moral. The reason you should be moral is for its own sake, not for any other reason. But for pragmatic reasons, not for moral reasons. Well, no, for purely moral reasons. Like I would say that it's immoral to put people in jail, no matter what, because it's doing something against their consent, or it's immoral to kill someone in self-defense, no matter what, even if it's the right thing to do. Like killing baby Hitler is immoral from my perspective, just because it's always right. immoral to impose involuntary wills on others, even if it's the pragmatic thing to do. So my view isn't we should be moral because it's pragmatic. My view, view is, is that we should be moral because it's moral. Just, and that's it, full stop. The reason, morality... Right, but that's, putting, that's, put, that's actually putting a kind of a moral all outside of the moral framework, right? So you're saying, okay, we have this objective morality, which can, which can function kind of as like a part of the universe, right? As some kind of natural law, you said? Yeah. But then, okay, so let's say this natural law gives everybody intrinsic rights, right? But then you still have to have a layer under that, which says, I should respect this fact... Like, I have a moral obligation to respect this fact that all these people have kind of this natural worth. Well, to me, it's a tautology. It's like asking, why should you do math? Like, why should you value math? Like, if you want to be a mathematician, you have to value math. But if you don't want to be a mathematician, then don't value math. So if you want right. to be moral, then you're obligated to be moral. But okay, you, good. So what if I don't want to be moral? Then you don't have to be. You'll just be immoral. So it's still objective in the sense that if you don't want to be moral, you will be immoral. You will be defined as immoral based on this objective law of morality, but you don't have to be. It's not like you're forced to be. Just like even in a theistic worldview, you're not forced to be moral. You can still be immoral, but you just be defined as immoral. You would you'd fit into the immoral category. Okay, but okay, so let, let's say half, half of the world's population decided to, they didn't want to be moral, right? Sure. So you kind of have this kind of competing, I don't know what you would call it, not necessarily war, but you just have these two competing groups, right? One is in this category of immoral, one is in this category of moral. Well, so then how is it not just arbitrary if the category that falls into the, like in, in the immoral category, if they all they say, no, actually our way of living life is the moral way, it's the correct way, all those guys can go screw themselves. How, how, right. how is it that we can make an actual judgment based on well, I could say that could be an undiscovered law of nature. When we discover the law of nature, we can give an accurate definition of how nature describes morality or something. Or I could just say the abstract best of all possible worlds has is one where there is no involuntary imposition of will, and if they disagree with this, then they would be immoral. So, okay, so I, my, my hard part is, the hard thing for me is when we're having these discussions, we, we're kind of making all these moral assumptions as we're going through. So, but so... And here's the thing, I actually don't completely disagree disagree with the fact that there is something built into nature about morality, that there is something about morality that's built into nature, right? Like a tree, if a tree wants to flourish, right, it has to kind of grow roots to get a foundation so it can drink water um, and all these other things. And so insofar as a tree doesn't do those things, it's not going to realize its purpose. And so I'm on board with kind of your framework, whereas if human beings want to flourish, then they're going to have to kind of have to go by this natural. Well, I'm not making that argument. I'm not saying that flourishment is required here, because I would say that if we tried to be absolutely moral, we wouldn't flourish. I'd say that the most moral group on the planet right now is the Jains, the absolute pacifist, nonviolent people, but they are easily um, out-survived by someone with a gun and you just, you can just take all their stuff. So it's not pragmatic to be moral. I'm saying that there is an underlying objective framework for morality and so just like you believe that morality is grounded in a being like a god or something i believe morality is grounded in just the fundamental nature of reality itself and just like you believe that the nature of this being is what is the source of morality i'm saying that the nature of nature itself is the source of this morality and they're equally as um obligatory they equally give us as much standing to say this is the objective morality and if you disagree with this you're wrong Okay, so here's here's why I would disagree with that. I would say the reason I think morality has to be grounded in a being, in a person, rather than just in some natural law, is because you actually, number one is you actually have obligations to persons, whereas I don't think you have obligations just to nature's law, um, except for in a pragmatic way. And there's an example I'll want to get to. Um, and the second part of that slipped my mind. 
We can, we can start with that one. So obligations, I'd say you have an obligation to another moral actor. You have an obligation to not hurt someone, but you don't have an obligation to some third party. The third party is irrelevant. But, but why do I have an obligation to another moral actor? Because it's moral. That's just what it means. Because it's a natural law. No, it's because it's moral. The morality itself, it means to be moral is that you have this obligation. There, there's tautology. It's like saying a bachelor is an unmarried man. Right, but, but you're saying that can be grounded in natural law. Right. So I'm asking, why do we have an, an obligation to that natural law? Well, why do we have the obligation to the God? How would you answer that from your perspective? So I would say it's kind of a combination between the, the, the purpose. So if, if there is a God who created rally and created us for a specific purpose, then anything we do um, in pursuit of that purpose, right? Because we have, I wanted to, I'm having a hard time because I don't necessarily believe in the divine command theory that just because he says so, right? So I think so his purpose stems from the fact that he is essentially loving, that he is essentially just, which are properties of persons, right? I don't think that that can be a property of nature, love. So you know? you're familiar with the Euthyphro dilemma? So is this, yeah. does God give us this purpose because it's what's right? Or is it right simply because God gives us this purpose? I would say he gives us his purpose because it's, it's in accordance with his nature. Okay, and is it in accordance with his nature because his nature is right, or is it right because it's his nature? Say that again? Uh, it's just the same dilemma, so let me, let me ask it to you a different way. Can God lie? No. And that's because his nature prevents him from lying, correct? Well, so, so God can lie in the sense that he would he would be logically capable of lying, but his moral character kind of precludes him lying because he doesn't do things that are in contradiction with his character, if that makes right. sense. So, so his nature prevents him from lying, correct? I'd be hesitant to state it that way, but sure. So that way I can just say the same thing and say, since God's nature is what makes it good, and it's not his choice, his choice is irrelevant. You can get rid of the personhood completely. It's just his nature that's doing it, and his personhood is just a secondary trait. Well, no, because because there's a difference between between the nature of personhood and then the nature of something that's not personal. So for well, example, it could love could be part of the nature of a person, right? Because love is a property of persons. Love couldn't be some kind of just the property of some kind of abstract thing. Well, love can be an emergent property of interactions between, uh, well, I wouldn't say it's abstract. It's a physical thing. So naturalistic pantheism wouldn't be a, a, an abstract thing. It would be a physical thing. So it wouldn't be an abstract thing. It would, in it's a, it's like a, person, but it wouldn't be a complete physical thing either, right? Because then yeah. that gets into the whole debate about free will, right? If we don't have free will and love is just kind of a chemical interaction in our brains and we don't choose to love anybody and you take the choice away from it, I would argue it's not even love. It's just kind of this chemical thing going off in our brains. Right. Well, I don't have any problem with that in my worldview because I don't think free will is even coherent. I don't think it's even possible logically. So from my worldview, it's equally reasonable to say that the natural processes of the physical thing of naturalistic pantheism create beings and those beings have this emergent property of love and that love is equally as real as anything that we could hope for to use as a basis of morality. Well, how, but how, how can you have those two things in the same world, uh, morality and no free will? Well, again, yeah. from my world, then, You can't even choose to abide by the natural law. Right. So from my view, morality is a description of the best way the world could be. It's not obligatory in the sense that it's moral for people to do things or not do things. It's moral for people to have... It's a description of the world itself. It's not a, an ought description of what we should do. Okay, that's so that's fair. So then we're just using morality in different ways, though. Yeah, well, that's just how I define objective morality. I see no contradiction with defining objective morality in that way. Well, I see. Okay, then I just, I just, the only thing I would disagree with there then is I just think it's misleading to use the term morality for that. Well, I, I think that my usage of the term morality is no less valid than your usage. So I don't see how mine would be any less likely to be a plausible case for objective morality than yours. I mean that that could be fair. I mean, I would say the way people have you know typically understood morality is is that there's a that part of reality encompasses a realm of moral values that we either are or aren't under obligation to use. Apart from that, then you would just be left to just I guess descriptions of social structures and the way people behave.
Well, most philosophers are moral realists. They believe in objective morality, but they don't believe... Most philosophers are not theologians. Most of them are naturalists. So they do believe in this objective morality that exists, but it's objective in the sense that it's an objective emergent property. It's not objective in the sense that it comes from some obligation from a being. You don't need that apart at all for most most people, most understandings of objective morality. Okay, so okay, so that that's fair. So you when you say it's objective, you mean it's an actual part of nature. When I when I heard you say objective, my mind kind of went to well, therefore we we ought to go along with that or do things that are in accordance with that. Right. So when I said objective, I meant like a law of gravity, like a law of nature, something physically we can scientifically demonstrate and measure objective, scientific objectivity. So you would agree that we, we aren't under obligation to go by it then? Right. I wouldn't say that obligation is a meaningful aspect of morality. You don't need it. Okay. So so this comes back to something I want to say. So you you were saying, okay, we like we have these two competing groups, right? These are the people who go would be considered moral and these people who would... And then you said, correct me if I'm wrong, that once we discover what this law of nature is, then we can look at that and say objectively... This side is right and this side is wrong. Right. So it's like if, if someone believes that um, the world is flat and one group believes that the world is round, once we scientifically discover it, we can say these guys are objectively right and these guys are objectively wrong and we're done. Okay. So I would say even that, though, would kind of depend on who you ask, right? Because you could say, say this group that we've called immoral, let's say they discover like the, like the fundamental thing about being human and living in the reality we live in is that suffering. Like that's, that's one of the most real things we can point to is everybody suffers in some fashion. And for them, the most logical way to get rid of suffering is to kill everybody else and then kill themselves. And they so according to their theory, they've succeeded. If they can accomplish that, they've succeeded in ridding the world of suffering. And right, that so would be I, in accordance with reality. Well, so I'm saying that the natural law itself is going to answer this question. There's an undiscovered natural law, which will answer the question when there's no feasible interpretation. Like we don't get to interpret the fact that the, the sun goes around the earth. That's not something we interpret. It's just a fact. You don't, you right. don't get an interpretation on that. So I'm saying the law of nature that we discover is going to be equally as unambiguous as the fact that the earth revolves around the sun. Okay, we're done. Right. So, I, so were you not disagreeing, though, with the example I gave? Well, so your example would be they would just be wrong in their interpretation. Like people can believe that the world is flat. I mean, I can't stop them from believing that. They're just objectively wrong. Right. Okay. So what? So what do you? So the specific example that I gave of the people say, okay, one of the most real things that everybody experiences is suffering, and here's we're going we're going to get rid of that by any means. What, what, what's the objective thing you can point to to say they're wrong? So this undiscovered law that we haven't discovered yet is going to say something like uh, any involuntary imposition of will is immoral. So if you're killing people... But if you, if, you, consent, if you haven't discovered it yet, though, how can you say that? Well, right, we haven't discovered it yet. That's kind of the point. So I'm saying there is this, there could be this undiscovered law of nature which gives us the definition of morality, objectively. So hypothetically, let's say we discover it tomorrow. Hypothetically, could it contradict everything that right now we think is moral? Well, sure, it's possible. Like we could discover we're in the okay. matrix. I have no idea. Well, that's fair, but that would be kind of my point is that then it's really just been theories up to this point based on. Well, right. We don't. We don't have any proof of objective morality. This is just. It's all a theory. So I'm just saying we can get a basis of objective morality without a god. We don't need a god for that. No, I can't prove it. Well, I don't have proof of objective fair morality. Enough. Fair enough. I would say. I would say. I think a god whose nature is essentially loving and kind would be a better explanation than a law which could hypothetically contradict everything we think morality is. Well, I would disagree because I would say that everything else has been a law. Laws seem to be a much better explanation of pretty much everything. I mean, okay, fair enough, but that's that's like saying... Well, well, let me put it to you this way. Let's say we lived 3,000 years ago and we said, lightning, you made the argument that lightning was clearly a better explained by Zeus because uh, we don't know of any laws at this point in time of nature that can do this, so it seems much more likely that this is a directed process by some kind of intelligent being. I can just be like, nope, I'm just going to go with it's a much better explanation to natural law because everything we've discovered in the past is a natural law. Why would you think this is a being? So for me, I see it as the same thing as just saying lightning was created by Zeus, moral law of nature is created by God. I don't see any difference there. Well, yeah, that, that's fair. But the thing is, like, 
we we can look in retrospect and say, okay, they were trying, to, they were looking at a physical phenomenon that they couldn't explain by other physical means, right? But they were still looking at a physical phenomenon. So we can say it's fair that it would be premature of them to just kind of punt the explanation, as it were, to something we don't understand. I, morality, I, was, I would say everything we like conceive about morality says that it's it's not a physical thing to be explained by other physical means. Well, that's like, the argument I'm making. I'm saying that it could be a physical thing, just like a physical law of gravity. So just like in the past when people saw lightning, they thought it was magic, and so it wasn't a physical process. Later we learned that, oh, wait, yeah, it is actually a physical process. So even though we think morality right now is abstract or something usually mental non-physical it could just be a physical process there's no contradiction there and since everything else has been a physical process it seems inductively that's a better explanation right so i mean so i'm just when i speak of morality i'm just i'm what would we say i'm i'm i, I completely lost my train of thought i apologize i was trying to think of two things at once and I you're you're saying something about how when you think of morality, you're probably going to say it's not a physical object or not a physical interaction of some kind. Well, I mean, that's the, it's like I could, if we were just making an evolutionary argument, I don't necessarily have any problem. Like, like I could sit right beside you and we could both work together on this theory of exactly what it is you're describing. I just, I wouldn't call that morality. When I'm talking about morality, I'm talking about something we would ha we would have we're under obligation to obey even if the laws of nature seem to contradict it like right, i'd say that that's begging the question you're already begging the question to try and define your morality into existence but we can just go with a different definition of morality and that alternative definition is right, equally but, likely to be the objective definition right but but when we but when we, when we say we can go with a different definition of something but then we just end up talking about something completely different that's not the same as saying well, there are these two competing hypotheses to explain the thing, and maybe one of them over the other, as opposed to, well, now I'm just talking about something different. Like, well, right, right. I'm what? saying that you, you seem to be begging the question again. You keep you saying that when I'm talking about morality, I'm talking about my God. That's essentially what you seem to be saying. No, no, no. Saying, no, 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 no. That's, that's not what morality is. We've got out of the picture. I'm talking about a realm of values, okay, that aren't physical. That well, we're right there. Not that's, that's begging the question. You're assuming they're not physical. They could be physical. Well, be because... If values were physical, then you, then and you take the obligation. You don't have an obligation to go go by them, and then as soon as you take the obligation away, it's not it's not morality anymore. Well, again, so you've already tied all of that into circular reasoning to def to define your definition of morality that way and assume that that definition is right. Like I could say, you don't need the obligation. This is morality isn't an obligatory thing. It's a description of the best way the world could be. So it's a description of reality or the way reality could be, not an obligatory thing. And I can say that is a better description of objective morality than saying morality is the same thing that holds obligation to us. Well, hold on. So, but saying saying a better, or what did you say? The best way a world. Yeah, the say? best way the world could be. Okay. Well, that that's very different than a natural law, though. Well, I could say a natural law could indicate what that is. So that would be epistemology versus ontology, two different. Fields. Well, no, a natural law would would uh, tell us that that's the way it is in this world, but not. What if there was a better world? Well, no. So I'm saying That's like, uh, law. like for example, gravity pulls all things together. So if we thought, mm -hmm. well, what if the law of gravity was taken to its extreme, then everything would be collapsed to one single point. So we can say the law of morality is something which inclines us to one direction, just like the law of gravity inclines us to one direction. And if we took the law to its extreme, this is what we would get. Right. But, but then you, you have to assume, you have, you have to make certain assumptions about what the, what the better version of that I'm hearing myself is that. Are you? I'm not. Okay. I'll ignore it. Um, what'd I say? Um, you said that you have to make certain assumptions about where the end point of this law would be or something. Or even just what a better possible world would be. Right. And I'm saying that's going to be intrinsic in the law once we, dis we discover it. So that's going to be part of the description when we discover it. But, but you've already granted that we could discover it and it could say... It could contradict everything. Right, it could. Like, it's like we could be in the matrix, but that's like fallibilism. We can still have knowledge without having absolute knowledge. There's no problem. No, no, I, I don't think it's like that because, for example, if – and I know this is an example. I'll just go, go over all the time, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it anyway. Um, of if Hitler had won World War II, right, and you and I were sitting here having this conversation, but we believe that murdering Jews was okay, we, we would say, well, the most likely thing that happens – when we discover this natural laws, it's going to confirm our belief that murdering Jews is okay. 
we could we can only say it from the current state of the way we understand things right that's pretty much how science works we have to go off of our inductive past to try and build a model of what's most likely to be the case which is fallible so it's fallible knowledge but that's fallibilism. So we, we don't need absolute certainty to know what it's going to be like. We can just say there could be this objective thing that once we discover it, it will give us the answer. So we don't actually need to know what it is for, for the purpose of my argument. There just needs to be the possibility of that thing existing. Now, then I'm going to use all of our past experience to get a best guess of what that could be, which would be our moral intuition and moral progress, which is the same basis of morality used by theists to try and describe for objective try and argue for objective morality. So we, we should agree that there is some basis of evidence for morality, and we're going to use that same basis to try and argue what the morality is. But we can't be absolutely certain. That's not an option. But that shouldn't be a problem for my argument. Well, the only problem I'm seeing is I don't see how then we aren't just a complete accident of history. We are an accident of history. I don't know what you mean. Well, but so are us being an accident of history to me doesn't go with we're we're likely to discover this natural law that just happens to confirm that us the group who as an accident of history has kind of come out top it confirms our morality over some other nations that could have been in the position we're in right now well my view of morality is that every single being should be free of imposition of will so that would include all animals all living beings all conscious things always no matter what so it wouldn't just apply to our society even even Hold on, but even if we lived in a world where the most pragmatic way to get ahead would be to impose will on others. Right. Right, so, but so in, in that world, your morality would contradict what, whatever the natural law seemed to be. Well, no, because I can jump. I can like uh, oppose the law of gravity and overcome it by jumping or building a spaceship or something, but that doesn't mean the law of gravity isn't there. It doesn't mean that it's the extreme of gravity is to pull all things together, even if I can get away from it. So there's still an objective law of gravity, even though we can fight gravity. We can overcome gravity. So the law of morality would be the same thing. We can fight against it and overcome it. That doesn't mean it's not there. Right, but th there's a difference between, like, I don't know, jumping to play basketball, which I'm, I'm just having trouble seeing how that's, analogous to the point where even if we lived in a world where it was most pragmatic to impose will on other people, you're still saying we we shouldn't do that. We, right, we so I'd say that the description of the morality would kind of be like gravity. So gravity pulls us towards one direction. If we followed the morale, if we followed gra gravity to its extreme, the world would look a certain way. Everything would just be collapsing on a single point. But Obviously, gravity isn't that strong, so it can't force us to do that. We can overcome gravity and go in a different direction. So there could be this moral law, which, if we followed it to extreme, would be the best of all possible worlds where there is no imposition on will. But we, it's not that strong, so we can overcome it to do immoral things. But see, okay, but see there, the now, but now, okay, help me with this, because now I'm seeing a contradiction between saying it, it's... Morality is likely to be a physical law, right? Or some kind of natural law. Right. Versus if we took it to its extreme, then we would have the best of all possible worlds. When we're talking about some of the best of all possible worlds, that we're now getting outside of nature. Because we're saying, well, regardless of how nature turns out to be, this moral law in the best version of that nature would impose itself on that. Well, no, I'm saying that it's like a law of gravity. So you understand the gravity example, right? Like if, if the law of gravity was the strongest thing in the universe, everything would be collapsed on a single point. It's just not. So morality could be the same thing. It could be a fundamental force that permeates everything. It's just not the strongest force there is. I think I'm following you. But the, the problem is with, with morality is that there's odds built into it. Like not just we are... I am sitting in this chair right now versus I should be sitting in this chair right now. If that distinction makes any sense. Right. So I'm saying the ought is an artificial uh, injection into morality. You don't need the oughts. The oughts are secondary. It's like saying this is the best way the world should be. And therefore we should probably ought to try and get close to it. But that's not really, it doesn't matter. The ought is irrelevant. You can just say this is the best way the world could be. So this is the grounding of morality. And then whether you want to pursue it or not, or whether you ought to pursue it as a secondary quality, it's not necessary to the morality. All you need for the morality is that this is the best way the world could be. See, I, I don't see how the odds are irrelevant when we're talking about the best of all possible worlds. Because we're, we're talking about, okay, that world would be better than this, 
because of X amount of reasons. So somebody should like hold on. My phrasing collapsed on itself. I apologize. Okay, so if we say this world is better than that world, how is not that not the same as saying, okay, the world ought to be like this as opposed to that? Well, there's, there's just different ways of phrasing the same thing, but you don't need the ought. You can just say, this world is the best way it can be, or this world is better than that world. But you don't, there's not like a, you're not forced to pursue it. You, it's like gravity can pull you to the ground, but you can overcome gravity. So, I mean, if you want to phrase it that way, yeah, you can just say you should or pursue or you ought to pursue the best of all possible worlds. That's the moral thing to do. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. But you don't need I, a I, being for that. That's just a description of the best of all possible worlds. You do need it for the... Uh, the, the one of the problems, again, I'm getting... It's because I'm having a conversation about a, a definition of morality that I don't agree with, so I'm definitely getting caught up here. So why would you need a being to say the best of all possible worlds is this one and we ought to pursue it? So like if we're just if it's just you and me, we're living in a world and there's lots of suffering and stuff, and we're gonna go say this world without the suffering is the best of all possible worlds, we ought to pursue it. We don't need a big being to say that to tell it to us. Like why would we need that? We can still have the ought without the I'm being. sure you don't need the being to tell it to you. Well, you don't need the being for it to be an ought. Why would you need the being for it to be an ought? Well, because again, we can conceive of two different worlds where one, the suffering is eliminated by just everybody choosing to not be a jerk, everybody just choosing to treat everyone else with respect, versus one where half the people decide, okay, we're going to kill the other half and then kill ourselves. In both worlds, the, the suffering is eliminated. Right, but I'm not saying suffering, I'm saying morality. Morality is itself no imposition of will, not no suffering. So only the world that has no imposition of will is the moral world. That is the best of all possible worlds. We can have an ought to go to that independent of some super being telling, us, telling it to us. And it could be a description of like, for example, there could be a law of nature that compels us to move towards this world uh, and it, it interacts with our brains in some way, just like gravity does. Yeah, but I'm um, not a law compelling us to want something isn't the same as we ought to want that. How so? Well, so just because a law compels us to do something doesn't mean that that's the best thing. Like just some people, brains compel them to do terrible things. Just because an ultimate being tells us that we should do something doesn't mean it's, it's what we should do. Fair enough. I mean, but unless you can. Um, unless that being wants the best for you. Well, remember, it's confined by its nature. So you're saying God is inherently good, which is why we should do this. So if there's some part of nature which is inherently good, which like the moral law of nature, then we should do it. We're obligated to do it for the same reasons. The personhood is irrelevant. It's purely about God's no, nature. No, no, it's not irrelevant because it changes what you mean by good at that point. Sorry, not my microphone. Well, remember, God's goodness is determined by his nature. He doesn't get a choice. He can't lie. He can't choose to do immoral things because his nature prevents him from doing so. Right. I mean, he still has freedom of the will, though. Like, he can choose one good thing instead of a different good thing. Well, that's fine. But the fact that his nature itself predetermines his choices, predetermines all of his personal choices, means his personal choices are irrelevant from morality. They don't even have a say in it. Well, no, no. Okay, so, so there's a difference between let's say, the range of options in front of him versus the grounding of his nature. So if, if we're talking about, okay, morality is grounded in God in this version, and then morality is grounded in nature in this thing. Well, God isn't a natural thing. So if morality is grounded in him, it's not a natural law, right? Wait, what? God isn't an actual thing? God, like God is, sorry, God isn't a natural <laughs> thing. Yeah, okay. So yeah, so, but the way... It does, he doesn't need to be a natural thing. So anything that a supernatural can do, the natural can also do. So if there is some way in which morality is grounded in God, it can be grounded in nature. Well, hold on, I wouldn't agree with the first statement, though, because... Well, you would... Because you denied free will, right? Right, I think it's incoherent. But if there was a kind of free will, if there was a coherent way to do it, nature could do it. Okay, how would that work? I have no idea. I think nature, that free will is completely incoherent. I don't think it's possible. With free will, without free will, with supernatural, natural, I think there is no way to get free will at all. Nothing you can do to get it, regardless of whether or not there's a God. Okay, so why, why couldn't you have it even if... Uh, why, so Okay, so why couldn't a God, if it exists, have free will? 
Uh, because free will is incoherent. Everything you do, like any action done by any being, including God, is either done for reasons, in which case it's determined by those reasons, or it's done for no reason, in which case it's by definition random. If it's determined and done for reasons, it's not free. And if it's random and done for no reason, it's not free. So th and there's nothing you can add to that dichotomy to get free. It's just there's no freedom there. It's either done for reasons, in which case it's determined, or done for no reasons, in which case it's random. Well, why couldn't we say, though, okay, there are reasons to do this, but I'm just not going to do it anyway? Then it's not a reason. So a reason by definition, reason and cause are synonymous. In what way? That's the definition of the words. Like, you just go to dictionary.com, type in reason, synonyms, cause is like the first one. Um, so a reason to do something is the cause or the reason it happens. So if there's a reason you would want to do something, but it, you don't follow it, then that's not a reason. It stops being a reason you did it. But so in, in order to have to do anything, to do any action at all, there has to be at least one reason which causes you to do it. Otherwise, there are zero reasons that cause you to do it. And if there are zero reasons to cause you to do it, you did it randomly. Now, there could be lots of reasons you chose not to adhere to, but no matter what, how many reasons you chose not to listen to, there must be at least one reason that you did. Otherwise, it has to be random. Those are the only two possibilities. Okay, so this is the first time I'm hearing this, so be, be patient with me. Um, okay, so let's say I had multiple reasons to do a bunch of different things, like at 2 o'clock, right? But I can't do all of them. So I choose one rather than the other. Right. So there has to be a reason you chose that one. And that reason forced you to choose that one. Or you had no reason and it was random. So why does that have to force me? That's what I'm missing. Well, that's the thing. If you if you choose one one option over the other option, there has to be a reason causing you to do that. Because if there's not a reason causing you to choose one or the other, then it was a random decision. It's completely random, like rolling a dice. So you have... Two options, just to make it simple. And you, you can have a list of reasons to pick one or the other. And that list of reasons has to make one weightier than the other to cause you to choose this one. You chose this one for this reason. And if there was no reason, then you chose it randomly by definition. It's, okay, so am I free to either choose to say, okay, you know what? I have all these reasons to do one of these things. Or, you know what? Uh, I can't take it. It's too much for me to decide this one. And then it's random. But, so are you taking freedom completely out of that equation? Right, because if your choice to do it randomly must have been done for reasons or must have been random. So like you could say, I could choose it for reasons or I could choose it randomly. I'm going to pick between one of these two options. There has to be a reason you pick between one of those two options or you're going to pick between those two options randomly. Well, so but, no matter but so then wouldn't that exclude randomness if you're saying that you would even have to have a reason to choose the random thing? Well, no, you could like quantum randomness or quantum fluctuations, like pure random function of the universe or something, which causes it to happen. I don't know. I don't really necessarily accept that, but it's a possibility. So you can't have pure randomness. But yes, I do lean towards the everything's determined side of viewpoint. Okay. Look, fair enough. I think I would have to do way more reading than I have done to prepare. Uh, I'll, I'll, g I'll give that one to you. Uh, fair enough happily, fair enough happily um i just don't you feel well okay well two two more points on that doesn't that just number one and i knew this is this is not an argument it's just doesn't that seem so counterintuitive though to to then you you were free to choose to have this conversation rather than something else that that, that was just kind of determined by nature that you would have this conversation um no like for me, because I've probably because I've been thinking about it for so long, it's really intuitive for me to understand determinism and how it relates to my actions. But I think if I didn't, it would probably seem counterintuitive. So, so everything, like also all our actions, ultimately. Let me ask you this: Are all our actions kind of determined, say, from the first moment, or are they kind of determined? That ah, that wouldn't make sense if I said that. Okay, so here's an example I've heard, and I don't know if this is going to be relevant to what we're talking about. But I'm, um, So for example, let's say I choose to take my hand and do this, right? 
uh, unless I, I choose to do this, and I, but I'm going to stop right before I hit my other hand, right? That there's a moment, like, okay, I've chosen to set up, there's a moment right here where now I'm not free to turn back, right? So it's definitely determined, like, once I start, because the moments are so closely linked, I'm, I'm not free to, you know, if, if that makes sense. So there is that kind of determination. So are you saying, does that go all the way to the bottom? Yes, right. I'm. I am pretty much a complete determinist. I think everything is determined, with the possibility of randomness of just quantum randomness. But pretty much everything is determined from my viewpoint. Okay, so so what would you say then to the argument? Because I'm sure you've heard this before that that would include your all all of your beliefs, all the points that you're arguing for right now, and then so are mine. You know, all the, the things I'm arguing here that morality is grounded in God and so forth. That yep. was all determined. And if, if that's all determined, how, how can we possibly even get outside of this conversation to what the actual ontological status of our beliefs are? Well, the fact that you're determined is why we have these conversations. Like, I'm determined to believe things based on a certain set of criteria, and those criteria can be met through argument. So if I experience an argument that meets those criteria, it will cause me to believe something new. And the same is true for most people, I assume for you too. So if you were came in contact with a good argument, it would change your beliefs because you're determined to for your beliefs to be changed. So my... Because well, not everybody changes their minds, even if they're confronted by the most coherent, best possible. Oh, argument. well, it's, it's like there is the fact... I don't know if you could be changed, your mind could be changed or not, but from my perspective, it seems that like if we excite the correct electrons or neurons in your brain to cause you to believe something, it will cause you to believe something. And I can attempt to excite those neurons by causing the experiences that would closely excite them as possible by presenting the most rational arguments. Now, whether or not I'm actually capable of doing that is probabilistic, depends on you, depends on other people, on a lot of different things. But because you're determined, I know that if I follow this path, a certain number of people will be convinced by it. So it's a good path to follow. Okay, so what, so let's just say hypothetically God does exist, but he created determined creatures, right? Creatures without any free will. And then Calvinists. So, okay, fair enough. So let, let's just say the Calvinist universe is the real one, right? And let's say it looked exactly like this, where you and I are having the conversation. Even if you could excite the right neurons in my brain to, to completely come over with your your belief system, it would, at on, on one hand, be in accordance with truth, right? Because you're, you're pers pers persuading me to believe in determinism, which is true, but then we're both atheists, which isn't true on that worldview. All right, so we don't have access to absolute truth. We don't, in, in any sense. So just being able to argue and debate, even if we created the best arguments and evidence, it would just give us a probabilistic description of what reality is like. We can't get to absolute truth through arguments. My position isn't even to say that there is no God. Like I, when In my introduction, I don't say, I believe there is no God. I say, I believe there is no reason to believe in a God. So my only concern is, do the evidence and arguments indicate a God, not whether or not God actually exists? I don't care whether or not people believe God exists or not. I only care, do they believe there's evidence for God, and is that true or false? No, no that's fair. I, I wasn't trying to saddle you with the, I believe there are no gods view. Um, well, I'm granting your point that we can't get access to ontology and what the fundamental nature of reality is. Even if it's determined or not determined, it makes no difference. There's no way to get to the fundamental nature of reality. Okay, but, if, but so okay, so help me with this because, like, if neither of us have free will for our beliefs, we we just happen, like, you just happen to have the right belief that turn isn't true. And to to me, I don't even think it's coherent to say, on that view, that well, if I can excite the sorry the right neurons in your brain, that I'm gonna just happen to persuade to the right belief because again, like me, like you're talking to somebody who like. I'm very happy to change my mind where I'm wrong. Like after this conversation, I'm going to be rethinking a lot of things. Um, but there are people we know of who like, it doesn't matter what you say to them. They're, they're hardcore. They're tied down. They're not changing their minds no matter what you say. And hypothetically, you and I, if we're determined, we could be those people. We don't think we're that way. Like we think that we're reevaluating things. We think we're pursuing truth. We think that our argument, our minds can be changed in the right direction. But if it's all determined, we, we couldn't even know that because all that stuff's out of our control. 
Right. We can't know that no matter what. We can't know that if there's a God. We can't know that if there's free will. The absolute knowledge is impossible. We can't. We don't have a grounds for absolute okay, knowledge. But, but so then, how do you how do you even have the knowledge, the framework where there are no good arguments for God? Uh, it's based off the fact of how knowledge works. It's the same thing. It's like we don't have any grounds of absolute knowledge. You're making an absolute claim, so you don't have any grounds to make that absolute claim. Okay, so I would ag agree with that, but I, I don't think it has the, the, imp the those implications. So, like, we talk about human knowledge being tentative, right? Yeah. I agree, human knowledge is tentative. Um, and then we talk about, okay, like, one of the examples you've given is no matter how much we study nature and understand nature, we could never conclude that, therefore, there is no supernatural, right? Right. And then the same thing should apply to God. Even if we could get to this being... And we, we could deduce certain properties about him. That wouldn't exclude the possibility of there being something outside who created that God. Right. Um, tell me what, I, I don't know that that works because, for example, science is the tool we use to understand nature. And that, by definition, doesn't access the supernatural, doesn't tell us anything about the supernatural, right? Right. Um, but so then when we talk about things like God, obviously we're not using science. We're using philosophy. And philosophy... Is the, is the discipline of studying the metaphysics of the way the world would be in any possible worlds. So philosophy is a tool to access something that is potentially the unactualized actualizer. No, a, not even a little bit. Philosophy yeah. is just, is not, it's not even as flawed as science, it's more flawed than science. So the reason science can't like rule out the possibility of the supernatural is because of the problem of underdetermination, the problem of induction. Uh, those are two big problems in science that prevent it from being able to make uh, absolute claims about what philosophy or what reality really is. Philosophy has the same kinds of problems. The problem of the criterion, the problem of universals, uh, the Agrippa's uh, dilemma. All of these problems exist in philosophy in the same way they exist in science. So just like science can't make absolute claims about what all worlds can be like, neither can philosophy. Philosophy is limited in the same way science is. Well, so I agree if philosophy is limited. I wasn't saying it was, it was unlimited. Um, I, I, I do that. Well, well, I'll leave that definition aside. I mean, you said philosophy is more flawed than science. Yeah, that's a little bit of my bias in there, but yes. Yeah, so no, no. I mean, fair enough. I'm not. I don't have a problem with that. My my own problem is because, and I, I'm sure you disagree with this because of the determinism thing. I would say you can't do science without philosophy. Like you need a, a philosophical undergirding to science. Right. Too. Right. You do. Okay. So just because it's flawed doesn't mean that we can't properly use it in some instances, right? Right, right. I'm not saying it has no uses. It definitely does. Right, have no okay, use. okay. I'm good. just saying one of those uses isn't to describe the fundamental nature of reality. Just like science can't describe the fundamental nature of reality, neither can philosophy. Neither one of them do that. See, I would just disagree. I think people much smarter than myself at faith. Hey, here's a question. If I could get convince Ed Phaser to come on, would you be willing yes. to come on? With oh me? yeah, I've invited him on several times. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, I would. I'd pay, I'd pay to watch that. Me too. Right. Look, admittedly, I'm very under-equipped. You, you've talked to people much smarter than me. You know, um, I appreciate you having me on for those reasons because I'm not necessarily any anybody special. Oh, but, uh, I appreciate you coming on. It's an interesting conversation. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, same. Um, where were we? I can't. Oh, uh, you said. Um, oh yeah, I, I, I mean, I just, I, again, people much smarter than myself have, like, at, at Phaser have, I think they are getting at that, and so you just disagree that their conclusions prove what they are trying to, right? Right, like uh, Alvin Plantinga and his modal realism stuff, like, I, I don't grant that the philosophy and modal logic can, can exclusively or exhaustively describe reality as this. It just describes reality as it coheres to the way we perceive the world. So the way our brains think works in a very logical, mathematical way, and we can use that as a foundation to describe all possible worlds that we can imagine. But that doesn't mean that's the way the world is, or the only way the world could be, or the fundamental way the world is. That's just the way the, our, the way our brains describe reality. It's not the way, it's not the essence of reality. Okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So may maybe one thing we could end on before we go, because I'm I'm kind of getting to the limits of my ability to do this. Because 
I mean, if, hmm. okay. So, because again, I'm sure you've heard of this before too. So, uh, okay. So you obviously evolution, right? So evolution makes the kind of beings, and so we're determined. So, okay. So would you say? And I hesitate to even use the word goal when it comes to evolution because it's not like evolution has this goal in mind and oh, I'm gonna aim for that, right? Right, right. But and and in a sense, there is something kind of built in, which is survival that's often talked about, like which natural selection is going to select for survival, right? Yep. Not truth. So, so, yep. so we agree on that part. It selects for survival, not truth. Yep. You're you're bringing up uh, Plantinga's evolutionary argument is naturalism. Pretty sure. Well, Are you I, with that one? I mean, the argument, I, I am familiar with it. I wasn't trying to make it. I was, I'm just going to try to go in a slightly different direction, but it's probably not going to be all that too much of a different direction. So if our beliefs are that way, right, that they're selected for their survival value, not truth, why is it that we can't say the same thing about, why isn't that, isn't it that mathematics wouldn't fall into that cath category? That is just survive, survive, bleh, I can't say it. It's beneficiary, beneficiary to our survival to believe that 2 plus 2 equals 4, regardless of whether it actually 2 plus 2 actually equals 4. It could. Logic and math could fall into that category of just something that's uh, beneficial to survival and not reality itself. Okay. That was kind of like Descartes' evil demon argument. Our understanding of math and logic could be fundamentally flawed, just something imposed in our brains by a demon. We just don't realize it. So logic and math are definitely doubtable. Okay. And would your belief... Like your your entire worldview, as you've expressed here, could that just be beneficiary to your survival? Absolutely. I mean, we could be in the Matrix. We could be deluded by Descartes' demon. We could be a brain in the vat. We could be a Boltzmann brain. All of those are possibilities. So my assessment of reality is fallible. So I just say the best explanation, the best abductive explanation of reality is that the reality we see is true because any addition we add onto that, there's infinitely many alternative additions we could add onto that. And they all cancel each other out. So we'll just stick with what we have now. And that's the best objective explanation. Well, so I, I think that's absolutely fair. I mean, I could be determined and I think I'm sitting here with for, for free will. So I'll happily jump in the boat of there's all these possible things. But you, you would agree with me that it's it, that's not reasonable, that there's still a degree of reasonable possibilities versus others that aren't? Well, I, there are definitely infinitely many reasonable and infinitely many unreasonable possibilities. But there... There but are you, 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 would say, you would say the fact that regardless of whether I'm determined or not, that I'm really looking at a screen at another real mind that's not my own, Tom Jumpin, you're doing the same thing to me, that that's more reasonable than we're in the Matrix? Yes, that's more abductively reasonable than we're okay. in the Matrix. Okay, good. So cool. maybe, we end, maybe we can end there because it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's common ground. We agree, yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah, so uh, thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this, and I'd love to talk with you again sometime. Absolutely. Maybe next time we'll get you on my show. I do, I do apologize. I'm certainly not of the intellectual caliber. I don't apologize. This, is, this was a great conversation. I really enjoyed yeah, talking no, with you. I, I really agreed, and, and like I said before, you're not going to catch me like, ah, I destroyed Chomp Jumper, or even being outside. Like, I will fully acknowledge right now, if this were to be classified as a debate rather than a discussion, you won hands down. I am more than happy that I thank you because now I get to better my beliefs and try to sharpen some of my arguments. And so it, it really does mean a lot that you had me on. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, my favorite quote is from John Stuart Mill is that if you only know your own side of the issue, you know, you know little of that. And my second favorite quote is from the chess, the fundamentals of chess, 1883. The only way to get smarter is by playing a smarter opponent. Because so that's the best way to learn is that when someone pokes weaknesses in your position, you know where, where to research next to improve. Absolutely. All right. Well, I got to start getting ready for my next debate coming up. So who's that against, if I can ask? What? Who's that against, if I can ask? Oh, uh, I've got one tonight on modern day debate with a uh, creationist bill something about did dinosaurs and humans live, live on the earth together? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll try to watch if I can. What time? Uh, it's like 9 or 10 p.m. Eastern time. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll try to watch that if I can. All right. Well, it was great talking with you. I'm going to go get something to eat. Talk Sounds to you later. Good. Take care, brother. Bye.